right. Hey, Jack. Jack, could you give me a hand with that thing over there? I'd really appreciate it. You see, I got my gun up here today, and I'm going to continue on on this Pentecost Sunday and this idea of fox, fox hunting. We're going fox hunting. Uh, somebody was asking me on Mother's Day, they said, are, uh, are you going to fox hunt today? I said, no, not today. We're going we're gonna... to. No, it's okay. I'll, I'll move it. Thank you. Uh, but I want to uh, talk to you for a few minutes this whole idea about fox hunting here today, and uh, I want to uh, talk about, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my subject, then I'll explain it to you, fox hunting, who, what, and where, fox hunting, who, what, and where, and I'm taking uh, my text from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, and I'm going to talk about the power of Pentecost in our lives, the purpose of Pentecost in our lives. And um, we're going to kill a few foxes along the way today. Uh, the, the misconceptions and the wrong ideas uh, about what Pentecost meant to the people of God, to the church of Jesus Christ in the world. Let's look at Acts chapter 1. Verses 3 through 5, let's read it together real nice and loud uh, so that we can get our text this morning. Let's, let's read it together. You ready? Here we go. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, as we look at this text, this is Jesus talking to the church, talking to his disciples actually, just before he was uh, going to go away, but, but he, he told them, he said, listen, there's something that's going to happen to you that's going to be a blessing to you, that's going to give you power in every area of your life. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, <clears throat> my idea this morning in, in this this message is that there are three questions or three areas or principles maybe that we need to ask over and over and over again if we're going to continue to be fruitful and blessed. Now, these ideas, who we are, what we believe, and where are we going, are, they apply to us as Christians personally because we all have to ask ourselves at some points in our life, am I really a Christian? Do I really believe this, this what this Bible says? Do I really believe that I am saved and a child of God and forgiven of my sins? Do I believe that what this book says is true and that I can build my life on it and, and that I can judge, you know, everything by it or can I believe where I'm going, where this book says I'm going. And you have to ask that self, that, those questions of yourself. We have to ask those questions as a church. As we go along, I have to come to where we get together and we say, okay, who are we as a church? You know, do we believe what we say we believe? Do we, do we live that out? Do we act that out in, in our lives and in the community? And, and, you know, in our families, we have to ask that same question. You know, who are we as a family? What do we believe? What is our values? What is the principles? 
that we build our lives on. It's very important for us to teach children values and principles. They, our children need to know what we believe and what we stand for, right? Um, in our businesses, we have to ask ourselves, who are we as a business? And what are our values? What are our core principles? And where are we going? You know, what's our goal? Who are we associated with in this business? Maybe it's a chain, you know, a national chain or something like that. So in business and, and in our nation, we are right now in a crisis because we are asking ourselves, who are we as a people? You know, and I'm not being political. You know me, I don't get into all the politics, but we are in a crisis today about who we are as a nation, as Americans. Um, what do we believe as, as the people called the United States? Who are we? And what do we believe? And where are we going into the future? We're struggling with these as a nation in American politics right now. And I believe these principles can be the little foxes that spoil the vine in our lives if we're not careful and make our vineyard unproductive and unfruitful. Song of Solomon said in 2 verse 15 in the NIV, he said, catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. As Christians, we have things that can hinder us from, from being productive, and we need to pay attention to these areas, who we are, what we believe, and where are we going. Now, on this Pentecost Sunday, I, I want to talk to you about Pentecost and what that means in our lives today, because Pentecost is a subject... Um, that there's a lot of confusion about and, and a lot of controversy about in the church, right? Um, you know, I asked a, a, a young pastor not too long ago, we were in a meeting together, and I said, what are you preaching about? And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, what, do, what have you been preaching about? And he says, well, you know, I'm doing this series. And I said, what is the series? And he says, how I overcame uh, what was it? My bad church experiences, you know. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you know how you get hurt in church and, you know, you know people are mean and, and they're judgmental and all those kinds of things. I said, yeah. I said, sure, I understand that. I said, um, hey, hey, why don't you try this one on? How about your dead church experience? Well, there's no life and there's no power in the church. He looked at me like I was crazy. He really did. But you know, one is as bad as the other, I think. Don't you? You know? And, and, and I believe that God has a balance and God has a plan for the church that it's filled with His grace and its glory and its power and it brings people together and it sees people's lives transformed by the Word of God, by the love of Jesus, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the church that I want to be a part of, don't you? And so we've all, you know, understood that this whole idea of Pentecost can be a, a confusing, controversial thing in the church. Now, what's interesting about this is Jesus talked a lot about what he was uh, going to do and what was going to take place in the life of the disciples. Remember, he called the disciples together in John chapter 13. He'd gotten to Jerusalem. He knew he was going to die on the cross pretty soon. And uh, he called his disciples together. And for three chapters, John 13, 14, and 15, he talked about one thing, and that's the coming of the Holy Spirit in their lives. When he was with his disciples, they ate the Passover meal together. And, and the Holy Spirit 
is really all he talked about because he wanted them to know what to expect and what God's plan for them was, for them to be fruitful, for the church to be productive, for the church to continue on in what he brought it together or created it to do. Now, let me say something about Pentecost here, and I'm, I'm not going to be long because I want us to pray today. If we don't do it, if the most important thing we do today is pray that God would touch us with his Holy Spirit, really. That's the most important thing. Now, let me talk to you about Pentecost because when I say the word Pentecost, what does that mean to you? You know, a lot of people, you know, Pentecost means weird and strange and and super spiritual stuff, and, you know, Pentecost. Uh, and listen to me. Nothing scares me. I've been to all kinds of them. I'm not an expert, but I'm telling you, I've got some experience in Pentecostal churches, all different kinds of Pentecostal churches. If I were to tell you about some of the churches that I attended that called themselves Pentecostal, you would not get near me after that. And the stuff they did. And the problem is it was some of my relatives that were involved in it. So, <laughs> but, but the word Pentecost, it conjures up all kinds of ideas and emotions. And let me say this. Everything bad that you think about Pentecost is an unbiblical representation of it. It's unbiblical. Because Jesus told his disciples, listen, you're going to, receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when he got his disciples there, that he breathed upon them. And I believe it was at that point, you know, they, 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 they were saved, they, they became born again. And then he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send my spirit and, it, and he's going to give you power. And so Jesus said that everything that's going to happen is going to be good for you and good for the church. But there are a lot of people who, who think of Pentecost in a lot of different ways. And so uh, some people look at Pentecost as being super spiritual, overly zealous, you know, people who are just driven by emotion. And some, of, some people are. As a matter of fact, I, that's kind of the church I grew up in. It, that when we talked about Pentecost, goosebumps went up and down your spine and emotional responses took place usually. You know what I mean? But let me talk about this a little bit and explain what the truth of it is so that it makes us more fruitful as the body of Christ in the world. Let me go on record here today, and I know I'm going on the internet, but let me begin by saying, if the church ever needed the power of the Holy Spirit, it's today. And the reason I say that is because we have more wounded broken people than ever before in the world. And only the Holy Spirit can straighten them out. Only the Holy Spirit can deliver them. Only the Holy Spirit can straighten out a twisted mind and, and a broken heart. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Amen. But Pentecost was one of the feasts in the Old Testament, there were three main feasts in the Old Testament, and um, they were God's people began to celebrate these three feasts. These feasts were nothing more than holidays. They were, they were just celebrations because God wanted his people to remember what had happened to them as they journeyed on their way to God's purpose and God's plan. You know, it's like 4th of July here in America. We celebrate 4th of July. We take off work because 4th, the 4th of July was when America became a free nation. We, we, we broke ties with Britain and we became our own nation. We had our own constitution, our own set of laws. And so now, every year, we celebrate the 4th of July. We take off work. We party, we grill out, we, we get crazy sometimes, we shoot fireworks. But it's for the purpose that we remember that we are a free nation. That's what the 4th of July is. And so we stop, we pause, we celebrate an event that took place in our history. 
And the Jewish people had three of these that they correspond with certain events on their journey. First of all was the Feast of Passover. Let me just give you these. Don't go to sleep on me. Just give me a minute so I can teach a little bit, okay? I know I'm in the Old Testament, but we, we need this. We, this is the foundation, all right? Look at your neighbor. Say, you need this. All right. Feast of Passover. And the Feast of Passover was a, a commemoration of when the Jewish people were in Egyptian bondage. And remember Moses, they, they you know, they, they were, Pharaoh was a bad slave master and he just beat them and abused them and they were slaves in Egypt. And remember Moses, God spoke to Moses, said, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And, and so Pharaoh, Moses went to the Pharaoh's house. Of course, that's, you know, was basically his stepdad. And he said, let my people go. And, and Pharaoh said, no. And so then Moses said, all right, here's what's going to happen. The death angel is going to come through Egypt. And I want you to take a lamb. I want you to kill it. I want you to take its blood, put it over the doorpost. And when the death angel comes, any household that doesn't have that blood on the doorpost, the firstborn is going to die in that house. And, uh, and if the blood is there, then the death angel will pass over that house. That's what it actually means. And then we know that after Pharaoh's firstborn died, as a result, they were allowed to leave Egypt. And they left Egypt. Of course, we all know the story of the Ten, you know, the Ten Commandments. We all know that. I don't know about you all, but I saw that movie, The Ten Commandments, in 1959 at a drive-in movie with my uncles and our whole family. And we didn't go to movies. We didn't go to shows, you know. But we went to the drive-in to watch the Ten Commandments. And, and it was portrayed in all of its, uh, you know, special effects. Of course, we see those special effects and they're cheesy as they can be today. But man, at, at that time, it was like cool, right? And, and so we, we looked at that and we saw that. And so, so here's the idea. Moses led them out of Egypt. And then they finally got over to a place called Mount Sinai. There was a mountain there. And when they came to Mount Sinai, Moses went up on the mountain. And the Bible says that God spoke to Moses. And he wrote on a tablet of stone, the Ten Commandments. Let me say this. Let me just throw this in. Bruce pointed this out to me. Do you realize the Ten Commandments are the only part of the Bible that God wrote himself? He didn't leave it to interpretation. He didn't leave it to human, you know, uh, clarification. He took his finger and he wrote the Ten Commandments on the tablets of stone himself because he didn't want the Ten Commandments to be misrepresented by man. That's how important God views the Ten Commandments. And I know there are people today that say, well, you know, all the commandments are, you know, done away with and we don't have to go with the old law. Let me tell you something. Those Ten Commandments are just as valid in our life today as they ever were. Amen. They're just as important because they are the law of God that created a people called the Jews. And so, at this Feast of Tabernacles, they were to remember that because 50 days after they got out of Egyptian bondage, they came to this mountain where God gave them the law. And then they were supposed to go over to the Promised Land, but because they didn't have faith, they wandered around. It only should have taken a few days for them to get over to the promised land. But they wandered around in, in what we, uh, it's modern day Saudi Arabia. Basically, it's where they were. For 40 years, they wandered around there before they ever got over into the promised land. And, and so the feast of, of Passover and then there was the Feast of Pentecost, and God said, I want you to remember that every year. 
And then there was the feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. And the Feast of Tabernacles is, is the idea where they wandered for all of those years until they made it to the promised land, until the, to the place that God had given to them. And so the Feast of Tabernacles was in the fall of the years, later in the year, and they were to observe that and remember their wanderings and their entrance into the promises of God. And so today, let me just give you this just quickly. See, first of all, the Feast of Tabernacles is, represents our going home to be in heaven. In other words, God has promised us that we're going to make it to heaven someday. The Feast of Passover is, is the is the feast that we commemorate and we remember being set free from the slavery of sin and the effects of that in our lives. But in the middle of those two is the Feast of Pentecost. And that's where we are today. We are not in the past. We're Christians. We've given our hearts to the Lord. We've accepted Christ into our life as our personal Savior. We're on our way to the promised land of God one of these days. Amen? We've celebrated the going home of some of our members here recently, you know. And they're always celebrations and, and they're always uh, to some degree joy-filled because they, they finally made it to their eternal reward and we thank God for that. But we are in this middle feast called the Feast of Pentecost. And it's that feast that we're in right now. There's confusion about it with some people. The whole idea of the Old Testament law is a confusing because we don't always know, you know, what part of it we should observe and what part of it we shouldn't observe. And, and you know, the dietary laws and, you know, the dress codes and, and all those kinds of things. And, and Jesus kind of, set that record straight because he, he said, listen, he said, I didn't come in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. He told them, I didn't come to do away with the law. I came to fulfill the law. But not to abolish the law, but to show it to you. In other words, the law, some of its practices were just for the Jewish people. They weren't for us, some of them. But, but the principles, Jesus said, are, are what I came to show you. In other words, I didn't come to do away with them. I came to affirm the principles in it. And they still apply to us today. Those who believe in God, those who say they are followers of God, the principles of the law apply to us. It applies to you. Look at your neighbor. Say, the law applies to you. The principles of it. Not the practice always, but the principle of it. See, the feasts apply to us in symbolic ways. First of all, the Passover. Let me, let me show you this. At the Passover, at the first Passover, a lamb was to be taken and killed at 9 o'clock in the morning. Then that lamb was to be put in the oven and cooked at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. That was, that was the law. And that sacrifice covered their sins. In other words, they understood that their sins were just pushed back for another year. But when Jesus came, he came to fulfill the Old Testament Passover celebration because he was crucified at 9 o'clock on Friday morning. He was put into the grave at 3 p.m. Friday afternoon. And His sacrifice didn't cover our sins. His sacrifice removed our sins. It took away our sin. It took away the curse that sin brings with it. We've been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ from the curse of sin. Amen. Amen. And see, he removed our sins. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, if you have that, Kim. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, 
says, get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And so the Passover was represented in Christ's death. The Feast of Pentecost was was here, here's the idea. You know, a lot of people have all kinds of ideas about Pentecost and what it means. And a lot of people are scared of it. And a lot of people freaked out by it. And like I say, I've seen a lot of stuff that call, that's been branded Pentecostal. And it's really nothing more than just, you know, emotional excesses and, and you know, personal grandizement. I, it is. But you want me to tell you what Pentecost means? Are you ready? Are you ready to be afraid? It means 50. That's what it means. Penta means five. Coste means 10. 50. See, Pentecost comes seven weeks after Passover, after Easter. So what happened on Pentecost? The Bible says that on the original Pentecost, there was a cloud above the mountain. There was thunder, lightning, smoke. There was all kinds of noise and fire was on the mountain, and God wrote His law on the tablets of stone for His people. And if, if you read the story, 3,000 people died that day. Remember when Moses came back down off the mountain with the tablets in his hand, and Aaron, his brother, you know, had fashioned a golden calf that they were worshiping, and they were doing all kinds of weird goofed up things, you know, they called worship, lewd, uh, ungodly stuff. And uh, the Bible says that earth opened up and 3,000 people died that day. And uh, in the New Testament on the day of Pentecost, however, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, descended with a loud noise. There was a sound as a rushing mighty wind. The Bible says there appeared cloven tongues or or individual tongues sat upon each one of them. And God didn't write the law on tablets of stone. He wrote the law on the tablets of their heart. Simon Peter struggled to do what was right. Remember, Simon Peter was afraid to even tell one little girl that he knew Jesus. But on the day of Pentecost, after he had been touched with the Holy Spirit, he stood up, preached the first sermon of the church, and 3,000 people didn't die. They came to life. They came to know Jesus. They were saved and born again by the Holy Spirit. See, God established His church that day. On the first Pentecost, when the law came, He established the nation of Israel. Do you know that the Jewish religion is the only religion that declares that it's God appeared to a whole nation of people, not just one person. All the, every other religion, God just gives some one person a revelation. The Bible tells us that God appeared to an entire nation of people, three million people it's estimated or more, that God appeared to. And so God established His people, but on the day of Pentecost, God established His church. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 and 4, Let's look at it again. It says, got it? Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire separating came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So as we think about this, we see that, the, that on the day of Pentecost, in the book of Acts, that the Holy Spirit came down and wrote the law of God on the hearts of the church. And then, the, then in the life of the church, it wasn't some rigid law. It wasn't some black and white stone tablet. It was the life-giving Spirit of God that lived inside the church. And so let's look at the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles celebrates that they were in tents and huts until they got to the Promised Land. They wandered for 40 years. They were 
brought to their final home. They celebrated it during the fall or the, the end of the year, the Feast of Tabernacles. It's also referred to as the Feast of Trumpets. And all these are symbolic of what's going to take place in our life. There is right now, let me say this, a great harvest taking place in the world. The church around the world is growing at 6.9% annually. Not in America necessarily, but around the world. It's growing three times faster than population growth. And let me say this, and I know you won't hear this from a lot of people, but the Christian church is growing faster, three times faster than the Muslim religion, Islam, around the world. Yeah, that's right. Amen. Today, today in China, 30,000 people will be born again into the church of Jesus Christ. 30,000 in one day in one country around the world. See, it, could it be harvest time is here. And the Feast of Tabernacles, it's called, and the, and the Jews don't understand why it's called the Feast of Trumpets. I go on to Jewish websites. And in many of their scholars, they say, we don't know why it's called trumpets. Well, we know why it's called trumpet. Because the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 15 through 17, if you have that, Kim, it says, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede the, those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. That's why it's a feast of trumpets. Because the Bible said, yeah, let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? Amen. And it, the Bible says that the Lord is going to blow a trumpet and the dead in Christ are going to rise and we which are alive are going to be caught up together with him. And so, that's why it's called the trumpets. And, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 12, it says they stood there amazed and perplexed on the day of Pentecost when all of this took place, when, when, when all this dynamic took place, the people that were there looked around and said, man, what's going on around here with these people? Some of them said they're drunk. Some of them said they're crazy. Sounds familiar to me. We've been called drunk and crazy our whole life. I used to hear preachers say, you know what, if we get a little more drunk on the Holy Spirit, maybe more people would get saved. Amen. Maybe more miracles would take place. So what does Pentecost mean? Let me close with this and we're going to pray. Let me first of all say that you can go to heaven without receiving the Holy Spirit. And each one of these receiving, you know, salvation, receiving the Holy Spirit and going to heaven, there are three different places on the journey of the Christian. And you can go to heaven without being filled with the Holy Spirit. You can all you have to do is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and, and His shed blood and confess that with your mouth and the Bible says you're saved. You're going to go to heaven when you die. Absolutely. But what does the Holy Spirit mean to us today? What does it mean in my life? First of all, the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. Powers me to live righteously. Acts 2 verse 17 the Holy Spirit empowers me to live righteously. It says in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Basically what that means is that you're going to be able to do what God wants you to do and you're going to be able to please God. Now let me say, let me give you my story real quick. I was raised in, a, in, a Pentecostal, in, in Pentecostal churches. And, you know, we met in all kinds of different places. We met in barns. And, you know, I, I went to church during my teenage years uh, to a Pentecostal church that was 
literally in a barn. It, it, I'm, I'm telling you, it was a real barn. I mean, they didn't have cows and stuff in there now, but they did have before, not too long before that. But, but, but I was raised in a Pentecostal church, and it was very outward focused rather than inward focused. And in other words, when I thought about the Holy Spirit or everything that was spoken of about the Holy Spirit in those churches was that the Holy Spirit, it, it represents himself outwardly. In other words, the people who, who prophesied, you know, they did it real loud, you know, with great enthusiasm and great fervor. I mean, sometimes if you were sitting in front of, you know, old brother so-and-so, when, when he got an unction from God, he, he didn't just say, um, I have a word from the Lord. It was, ah, bye, 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 you know. It was outward. The preachers that I heard preach that were Pentecostal said, the Holy Spirit is anointing me right now. In other words, they were, they were men who were not very eloquent. Most of them were somewhat uneducated. And they depended on the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, but it was tied to emotions. They, they were big on not going where the world, not thinking like the world, not doing what the world does. It was very outward, what you wore, what you did. And, and uh, the work of the Holy Spirit was just the outward manifestations of the Spirit of God. But I understand now that that was kind of an unbiblical view of the work of the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit's work began inwardly inside the heart of the believer. And, and the problem with that was, was I never thought I measured up or that I could ever give myself so completely to the Lord that He could use me to run up and down the aisles of the church or prophesy or preach or whatever. I just didn't feel like I measured up. But here's the problem I had. And I think it's the problem many of us have. At the same time, I understood that I had difficulty in doing what I knew the Bible taught me to do, in obeying the Scriptures, right? I had difficulty. I knew my weakness. I, I knew that I would succumb to temptation. I, I knew I was vulnerable. I knew that. In my own heart. And, and so, um, when I was 21 years old, I did my best to go to church and, and, and all of that. But when I was 21 years old, I came to a place in my life where, uh, let me tell you what happened. I went to a high school prom. But, but the deal was, that I went to this prom and here's what happened. This girl that, you know, I spent like $75 to rent a tuxedo. And what happened was her boyfriend had just broke up with her like a week or two before. So she asked me to go, so I go. And when I got there, we walked in, sat down at the table. She got up and left. I never saw her the rest of the night. <laughs> true story. That's a true story. She just used me to walk in. So, I, you know, I, I'm just an abused guy. <laughs> That's what I said, you know, last week. Some of you girls, you know, you got some issues too, you know. <laughs> but I remember, uh, they, you know, they were trying to comfort me. My, my buddies were, oh, man, it's all right. Don't worry about it. And I wasn't like all bummed out. I, but, you know, I was, I was like, you know, I've, I've been made a fool of here. And so they kept pouring something into my drink, my Coke. Oh, no. And I was drinking. I knew it was alcohol, but, you know, I, I didn't, I, I never, I, I didn't know what it would do to me, I, you know. And they just kept pouring. And I, I, I remember this. When I got home, we got back after the, after the prom was over. I got back home. I sat down on the floor and just went unconscious. And I woke up the next morning, and my head felt like somebody was hitting me with a hammer. I had a worse hangover. I was sick to my stomach. <laughs> and I, here's what I, th I thought to myself, 
God, if this is what partying is, I want nothing to do with that. And so here's what, but, but here's what happened. So that night, I remember that night, I felt terrible that day. And the Holy Spirit was speaking to me saying, you knew you shouldn't have drank that. And I said, you know, I know. But, you know, my cousins were, you know, tempting me. They were, you know, you know how it is. And uh, I got down next to the bed that night, and I, I prayed, and I said, God, now listen, I want to be a Christian. I want to live my Christian life as I should. And I want to give my heart to you right now. And whatever it takes for me to have the victory and the power to overcome the temptations, because those temptations that I had last night, they're going to come again. I'm going to be tempted more than yesterday. And Lord... If, if I have to run up and down the aisles, if I have to flop on the floor of the church like a fish, that's what I'll do. That's what I said to God. That's what I said to God. It wasn't too long after that, I went to a church and they were teaching about the Holy Spirit. And so I went to a, a big crusade meeting on a Friday night. I'll never forget it. I went by, all by myself. I drove up to another city about 90 miles away, you know, about an, over an hour uh, from my home. And I went to this meeting, and here's the, all I can tell you is I was a shy, kind of an introverted boy. I, I mean, I had a lot of fun at school, but I wasn't, I just wasn't, I was just shy. And at this meeting, something happened. All I can tell you is Somehow, some way, God just touched my life supernaturally. And He filled me with the Holy Spirit. I, I, I received a prayer language that was just, was like awesome. Was. And you know, I, on the way back, on the way home that night, I, I came to the realization that I was always going to be saved for the rest of my life. I was a son of God. I doubted that until I was 21. I, I wasn't sure about that. I never thought I could make it. I thought some sin or some temptation would get a hold of me and take me out at some point. That's what I really believed. But that night, when I received the Holy Spirit, I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew I was going to make it. Here's my point in saying that. Me and God worked that out. I could have run away from the church and left the church and never came back and pointed my finger and said, look at all those crazy people that I knew and was related to. But you know what? Me and God worked it out. And that's what I encourage you to do. Work it out with God. Listen, we all got bad church experiences. We all got, we all got issues. We all got things that we, you know, that are strange. But work it out with God. And what that did was it took me from a have to to a want to. It took me from i got to do this to I get to do this. In other words, the Holy Spirit empowered me to live this life the way it should be lived, from the heart. Amen. Romans 8 and 9 said, You, however, that are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit, if the Spirit of God lives in you. So He empowers us to live uh, righteously. Secondly, he empowers us to live supernaturally. Acts 2.19, look what it says here. What happened just after the uh, uh, Pentecost took place. Acts chapter 2, verse 19. I'll show you wonders in the heavens above, signs in the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. In other words, there's going to be some supernatural things that you're going to see. Um, and these supernatural things 
are not what man does. They're what God does. And honestly, you know, we do our best to, to you know, hone our skills and be the best we can. But at the end of the day, if God doesn't touch you when you come here, what difference is what we do? Does that make? It doesn't matter. You see, God is a supernatural God, and they that follow Him are people who see supernatural things. We don't have to conjure it up. We don't have to make that happen. We don't have to, like, you know, try to make a circus out of it all. We just live the Spirit-filled life and do what God wants us to do, and He just does supernatural things all around us. He just does. Kim was saying, you know, in their, in their Bible study, three people got healed last week. They went to the doctor, and they confirmed that they were healed. Nothing was wrong with them. Supernatural things. I've seen people come to church, and I think to myself, God, you know, how in the world are they ever going to change their messed up way of thinking, their messed up way of living? But then I see all of a sudden, man, their life has changed. Their life's transformed. Their life is different. And you look at that and say, wow, it's a wonder, it's a sign. You know, isn't it better to serve a God that you just look back sometimes and say, whoa, God did that then put God in some kind of box and you got Him all figured out and you can make Him do what you want Him to do. Amen? See, He empowers us to live supernaturally. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. Look at that, and then we're going to finish. My message and my preaching, Paul said, was not with wise and persuasive words, but with, with demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest upon human wisdom, but on God's power. See, the church is a supernatural place. And supernatural things take place in the church. Let me give you this one story. I was with uh, Admiral Clark. Admiral Wendell Clark. Vernon Clark. Admiral Vernon Clark. He was the head of the United States Navy from 2000-2005 in the Bush administration. He spoke at a, at a meeting we were in, and we met him. I, Got my picture taken with him. And, and Admiral Clark was in the Pentagon that day when the building, when on 9-11, when that building struck, 47 of his people in his department were killed. But he told us a story that it was the second ship that he had commanded. There was 37 men on this, men and women on this ship. And he said they were over in near the Mediterranean Sea. And he said this ship was, was designed to take eight to nine foot waves. And, and when, it got, when the waves got bigger than that, he had to go in. He said a hurricane came. He, I forget what storm it was. 22 foot seas, 120 miles an hour, he said. His father is an Assemblies of God preacher from Missouri and uh, graduated from Evangel College. And... Uh, he said, we dropped anchor, we couldn't hide, we couldn't get to a place, you know, where the wind wasn't hitting us. And he said, we dropped anchor. And he said, we were being drugged at four knots, full anchor in the, on the ocean floor. He said, we had 120,000 horsepower on one uh, gear and 120,000 on the other. And he said, we were trying to turn that ship into the wind so that it didn't blow so hard against us. And he said, what was worse was we were headed toward shallow water. We were getting ready to run aground. He said, the worst thing you can possibly do if you're a commander of a ship is run that thing aground. He said, these guys that have run these ships aground here... Sheila said to Austin the other day, hey, let's take a cruise. He goes, I'm not taking a cruise. She said, why not? He went. <laughs> he sees all those ships, you know. 
sinking, you know. And he said, I didn't know what to do. He said, I was headed for the, for the land up on the rocks. 37 men's lives were in, women's lives were in danger. And he said, my career would have been over. And he said, I got over in a little small section of the captains, you know, up in the, where they run the boat and bridge. Yeah, thanks. And uh, he said, I looked out that window into the night and he said, all I could say is, God, now you brought me to this place in the Navy where I am. And if, if you want to end my career, then just let us run aground. But if you want me to continue on, if you've got other things for me to do in the Navy, he said, you got to do something because I'm in trouble here. He said, I looked at the, you know, my officer, and he said, I want you to kill the power, and I want you to give me 15% on the starboard, on starboard engine. And he said, he looked at me like I was crazy. I, 120 mile an hour winds are blowing against me, 22 foot waves. He said, these waves were taking this ship and it was almost turning upside down. And he said, give me 15%. And he said, we sat there. He said, I didn't know every time if that thing was going to flip or not. He said, but about 45 minutes later, he said, because those ships, you don't turn those things that quickly. You know, it takes a, a little time for those things to maneuver. And he said to my assistant came to him. He said, Captain, it's turning. He said, what? He said, it's turning. Ship is turning. And he said, after about 30 minutes more, he said, we got that ship turned and it was headed right into the wind and into the waves. He said, we took a few waves, big waves up over the bow. He said, but we went at the storm. We went through the wind. And he said, we were safe. He said, I look back now and I realize only God could do that. Only God. Right. Only God. He's supernatural. And then lastly, he empowers me to fulfill his mission in the world. Stand with me. The Holy Spirit, Pentecost Sunday, is, is the feast of Pentecost. And God wants to pour His Spirit into us today. He wants to let that life-giving power, His power, to live in us. He wants us to live righteously in the world. He wants us to live supernaturally in the world. And you know what? It's not about when we witness it shouldn't be about, well, I believe this and you believe that. And I believe this and you believe that. And I'm right and you're wrong. No. It's God demonstrates His great power in our lives through what He does in the lives of others. That's what Pentecost is all about. And that's what the Holy Spirit intended to do in the church. And anything that's looked at as bad is a wrong view of what God wants to do in our hearts. So here's my idea this morning. I want us to pray. You need to receive the Holy Spirit. And when I say that is, you might say, well, I did. Well, I did too. But I need a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. And if you struggle with, you know, what that looks like and how that is, just work it out with God. Work it out with God. He's not going to hurt you. He's not going to embarrass you. He's not going to make a spectacle out of you. He's just going to touch you with His power and His grace to give you victory. So that you can have the power to overcome temptation. So that He can write His law in your heart. So that you want to live out this Christian life. So you want to prophesy. So you want to dream dreams and have vision. Bible says. So here's what I want us to do this morning. I want us to pray. And if you're here today on this Pentecost Sunday, don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. Don't be afraid. God wants to touch you 
with a supernatural touch of His power. You can't live this Christian life on your own. You can't make it on your own. You can't do it. All three of these feasts were what God did. Not what man did. It was what God did for them, in them, through them. Amen. God wants to do that today in your life and mine. So here's what I'd like us to do. If you want to be touched with the Holy Spirit in a fresh new way, I want you to come and just stand right up here with me. And I want us, as the church, to just be receptacles, to just put our antennas up and say, Lord, I need your touch and I need your grace in my own life right now. You might be going through a difficulty. You might be going through a temptation. The Holy Spirit will give you the power to overcome it. So let's join together as we close in prayer on this Pentecost Sunday. And I want you to come and stand here with me. And then we're just going to stand and say, Lord, just let Pentecost happen in my life today. Let Pentecost happen in the church again. Let it be fresh. Let it be new. Let the supernatural work of God be done in us today, Lord. Let it be done in us. We want it. We need it. God, just, just help us to work through it with you. That's right. Just join together. Just raise your hands and just, just ask the Lord to touch you. Just be receptive to what God wants you to do. Just let the Holy Spirit just transform your life in a fresh new way this morning. That's right. Come on, let's pray together. Oh, Lord, we bless you. We praise you. We honor you. We glorify you, oh God. We are gathered here today, Lord. One heart, one accord one mind, Lord, like they were on the day of Pentecost. We come, Lord, to receive what you have for us. We come, Lord, to be blessed by you, to be touched by you. Now we open our spirits and our hearts to you, Lord. And any false doctrines or unbiblical teaching, I bind in the name of Jesus those strongholds in our mind that prevent us from the greater work of God. We bind that in Jesus' name. And Lord, we ask you to touch us with your grace and your power. We receive what you have for us right now in the name of Jesus as we worship together here today. Lord, touch the church. Fill us with your spirit afresh and anew, O oh Lord. Let that same spirit that was present in the New Testament church be present in our church today, Lord. We need it. We can't make it on our own, Lord. We, we can't live this life on our own. We need your touch. We need your grace. We need your glory in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, bless your people today. We receive what you have for us in Jesus' name. Those of you who got your prayer language, just pray. Just pray in the spirit for those that are here. Just pray. Lord, let your word do what you intended for it to do, Lord. Let it, let it be powerful. Let it penetrate our hearts and lives, God. Touch our young people with your presence, O oh Lord. Let them dream dreams and have visions. Let them prophesy in your name, O oh Lord. Let them fulfill the mission of the church, O oh God. We can't do that on our own. We don't have the strength, the ingenuity, or power, humanly speaking. Deliver those that are in bondage, Lord. We cast out every high thing that would exalt itself above the knowledge of God. We bind every diabolical spirit, every stronghold in the lives of God's people. Set us free, O oh Lord. Set us free to become the church of the living God in the world today, O oh Lord. That's right. Just receive what God has for you. Just receive it. Just receive it by faith. Just receive it by faith. That's right. Just receive what the Lord has for you today. 
situations, Lord. You've gathered us here for your purpose. And now, Lord, equip us with the Holy Spirit to do what you have called us to do. Be what you've called us to be. Thank you, Lord. God, there are those you need to fill because they've lost something. There's empty places in their hearts. Fill that today, Lord. Lord, there are those that have been wounded and broken. Mend the broken heart today. Let that heart be a container of your grace and your love today. Do your great work in us, Lord. Provide for that that we do not have, Lord. Be that, Lord, that we didn't have. Be that father, Lord. Be that brother. Be that friend, oh God, that we need. Fill us today with your presence as we worship together today. In Jesus. In Jesus. In Jesus. Fill us, Lord. In Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, the Lord is good today. Amen. The presence of the Lord is sweet. Amen. Like honey on our lips. Water to our soul. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you for being here on this Pentecost Sunday. So don't forget who we are, what we believe, what we're called to do. And God will just keep us on the right path and bless us if we'll do that. God bless you. Don't forget missions meeting, short missions meeting coming up. Meet right up here if you would. Thank you. God bless you.